Hello and welcome to another episode of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host, Melissa Whitecross, coming to you live from Johannesburg, South Africa. Tonight's webinar is going to showcase the business case for birds and biodiversity. This is an important mechanism for trying to establish financial benefits for our biodiversity in the corporate sector. But before we get into tonight's webinar, please remember that you can communicate with us using the Zoom chat room and questions for our speakers can be posted in the Q&A box throughout the webinar. If you're watching us on Facebook Live, you can use the comment feed for your comments and questions, and we'll be sure to answer all of these at the end of tonight's webinar. Now you can use the hashtag conservation conversations to get in touch with us on all major social media channels and catch up on all of the previous episodes via BirdLife South Africa's YouTube channel. And as I mentioned earlier, if you missed out on Jonathan Rousseau's talk last week, I would highly recommend giving that a watch. Now, so many of you have generously contributed to keep these webinars free for all to learn and enjoy. Every little bit helps and we really do appreciate your support. All you have to do is scan that Cricut QR code on screen or visit our Conservation Conversations website to find the link on the donations tab. If you're a member of the South African Listers Club, be sure to let BirdLife South Africa know what your total is, and you can join BirdLife South Africa in celebrating birds and birding by joining this club through our website. You can also collect your special milestone badges as you go. Build up your South African flag as you progress through your list of milestones with proudly South African colored pin badges as you hit the 100, 200, 300, 400, and 500 marks. Be sure to get your badges. Now, reaching a milestone in your birding journey is something worth celebrating, and each badge is only 75 Rand. So be sure to purchase these through our shop, shop.birdlife.org.za, and that is online, and you can get everything you need to celebrate your birding journey in South Africa. Now, you can join BirdLife South Africa and Eco Training for Birding Big Day in the exclusive Makuleki area of Northern Kruger National Park, and that's taking place in November. So be sure to get in touch with Wesley Abrams at projects at ecotraining.co.za to take on mouth-watering specials like the racket-tailed roller, three-banded courses and pearls fishing owls that call this incredible place home. Now it gives me great pleasure to welcome three of my friends and colleagues to the Conservation Conversations platform. Two of them have been put in multiple performances this year and we're really great to have Kishay Lynchetti, the Senior Environmental Advisor for ESCOM, back on the show, as well as BirdLife South Africa's Ingula Project Manager, Karina Pinar. Now, Kish will hopefully join us at the end of the webinar for questions, but he has luckily pre-recorded his contribution this evening, who our next guest, Dr. Gabby Terran, who is the Manager of the National Biodiversity and Business Network at the Endangered Wildlife Trust, will be sharing with us. Now, the NBBN works with forward-thinking businesses to understand their dependencies and impacts on biodiversity. Gabby is a terrestrial systems ecologist and holds a PhD in elephants and biodiversity from Wits University. Her academic research focused on how wildlife, vegetation, and people interact over time and space. And I had the privilege of studying alongside Gabby back in the day, and it's great to see some Bits alum ending up in the NGO sector, making a difference for our biodiversity. So without further ado, it's great to have all of you on the show this evening, and a big welcome to you, Gabby and Karina. And I'm going to now hand over to you to share your screen with us, and we look forward to what you have to share with all of us tonight. Thanks, ladies. Thanks so much, Melissa. Just going to share my screen. Um, can you uh, see the presentation? We can indeed. You just got to put it into presenter mode. That would help. Yeah. Fab. Epic. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so Thank much, you. Melissa. And uh, thanks everyone for for joining this evening. It is a a real privilege to be here. Um, as Melissa mentioned, we, we studied together at WITS and it's always lovely to kind of join your, your pastor classmates in an evening when you're separated quite far away, even though it's uh, to chat about things which we aren't working together on. I'm based in Somerset West at the moment and I um, work for the Endangered Wildlife Trust. And 
I have moved on from looking at how elephants impact biodiversity to looking at how businesses impact biodiversity um, and really how to engage with businesses and how to get them to understand their relationships with nature and how to improve their relationships with nature. So really excited to, to be here tonight where I'm going to be chatting a bit about how businesses relate, um, throwing some, some birds in there as well, although I'm going to leave a lot of that up to, to Karina, who uh, has had some really great field work uh, dealing with birds and in terms of their evaluation around their impacts from businesses. And really tonight I'm going to be chatting about some of the, the higher level issues, how, how businesses globally relate to, to biodiversity and what their performance is like in South Africa. And it's interesting to have heard your, your poll results um, because I'm not at all surprised that there is a fairly large percentage which um, of, of you have said that you haven't really thought about engaging in terms of how you purchase or how you support companies because of their impacts on, on nature. Because um, as somebody from the audience correctly pointed out, there's actually very little information out there in terms of cumulative impacts on nature and how companies actually engage with nature. So hopefully I'll be able to give you a bit more information on that and how we're assessing that. And, and really this is, is going to be the start of a conversation, um, which I'm hoping to, to kind of take forward to many different companies, to the, the private sector, to the public sector. And we need to start opening up these, these conversations and, and reducing impacts on biodiversity. In terms of how businesses relate to biodiversity, I think we all know starting from the top of the iceberg that there is a massive biodiversity crisis. We're all into um, conservation here and, and these stats are sometimes fairly alarming. There's over 1 million species that are at risk of extinction due to nature loss. And over 75% of the land surface has already been significantly impacted by people. To counter that, there is a 2050 vision from the UN, which ultimately wants to create a planet where we live in harmony with nature. And there are several processes to, um, that have been put in place to work towards this, such as the Convention on Biological Diversity, which sets global targets. Businesses relate to biodiversity in very intricate ways. And businesses really would not be able to operate without nature. They have dependencies such as producing goods or ecosystem services. Um, where ecosystems produce, for example, crop pollination or clean air and water, and businesses depend on these very systems for their products or services. However, businesses also impact on biodiversity. Um, and the private sector is one of the primary drivers of biodiversity loss globally, and it's something that isn't particularly well highlighted or, or well talked about when, we, when we're thinking about this. A lot of the attention has been put on the private sector's impact on, on climate, for example. But that goes very much hand in hand with biodiversity. And the reason that there hasn't been this engagement and hasn't been at the forefront of, of international talks is that there is number one, very little understanding. Most companies have no idea how they relate to nature and how what their dependencies are either at a direct operational scale or even through their supply chain. Most companies um, through global supply chains don't even know where direct raw materials are even sourced these days. There's also little caring um, and there hasn't been a need for it. Um, our, our economy is based on financial models, um, very much are the kind of du jour of the day and, and there's been very little momentum for, for companies to want to engage. Only 18% in terms of a, a recent study of global investments over the past year were actually labeled as green and sustainable. But with these massive biodiversity losses comes massive biodiversity or risks to businesses. Over half of the world's GDP, which is sitting around 44 trillion US dollars, is either moderately 
or highly dependent on nature and exposed to risks from loss. 50% of the biggest companies in the next five years will face 1 trillion US dollars in costs unless they're actively prepared for climate change. There was a very big study done by the World Economic Forum, which looks at the, the global risks to businesses every year. And this diagram on the right hand side shows all of the different uh, risks which have been identified. Um, for example, there is um, mental health deterioration in the, the bottom left corner, which I think we can all, all attest to. Um, and for the first time ever, infectious diseases are in the very top right after, after COVID. However, if you zoom in, um, top rights are being the most um, likely to occur with the highest impact in terms of impacting businesses. Climate action failure is on the very top, but biodiversity is not far behind. And in fact, apart from infectious diseases, i.e. COVID, most of the, the risks to businesses are related to nature impact in some way. And so businesses are gradually understanding that they have to recognize their values and they have to recognize that there is a massive impact globally. Um, and we need to move from recognition to, to doing something about it. There are emerging biodiversity disclosures globally However, there is still very little information out there. In a recent study out of the US um, Fortune 100 global companies, only 31 of them had clearly stated biodiversity commitments. And only five of these had commitments which were smart, so specific, measurable, and time bound. And so there, even at a global level, there is very little information on cumulative impacts on on nature. Um, there's been very much a focus on greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and I think if you, if you watch the news and if you watch any of the economic reports, that is very much still a focus when talking about sustainability. There's also been a focus on kind of fragmented environmental disclosures, such as water use or, or waste. Uh, plastics has obviously seen a very big um, interest in the last couple of years. Um, and there is no real looking at the bigger picture in terms of biodiversity for a company. So there's very little quantified information. And some of the companies and some of the policymakers even are saying, well, biodiversity is too difficult to measure. How do you measure the impact on nature? And what kind of indicators do you use? Um, if you've got different sites, how do you consolidate those impacts? And there is a lot of movement, thankfully, in the international space to try and answer some of these questions. So for example, we have the new science-based target network and through reporting requirements, which a lot of the JSE companies, for example, are aligned with, they have to report on their biodiversity impacts. The EU for this year, I mean, this year, for example, I think in about May, um, put in a new recommendation that all medium and large sized enterprises based in Europe have to, report, have to report on their impacts and biodiversity, not just mega corporations. So disclosures are becoming increasingly popular and increasingly legislated, but we're still lagging very, very far behind. And we have to do something now to reverse nature, not nature loss so that we can actually all live sustainably. Obviously, there are challenges that are unique to developing countries and to South Africa, for example. And the Endangered Wildlife Trust recognized this about um, 13 years ago when we formed the National Biodiversity and Business Network. We saw that there was a lack of guidance or, or useful information on biodiversity performance for both internal and external stakeholders including shareholders, including investors, to drive meaningful change. And so what we started to do was engage with businesses. We opened up the, the platform for companies to join the network, to discuss their, some of their material issues in biodiversity, to ask questions on how they are, are depending on biodiversity, and to really start a sectoral specific conversation around this. 
we realized that there was very little information out there. So we published biodiversity mainstreaming guidelines, which are nine steps. Um, so the infographic on your bottom right, nine steps of how businesses can mainstream biodiversity into their business practices. From understanding why they should do that to identifying their, their risks, to identifying their biodiversity dependencies. And we have these freely available guidelines up on our website for, for any company to, to access. We then went one step further and actually used these guidelines, which are part of a biodiversity mainstreaming journey and showing how well companies can integrate biodiversity, to actually then rating all of the companies on the JSE, as well as um, several state-owned enterprises. And so what we did is for, um, we've done this for the last three years, we've rated all of the companies in the JSE using publicly available documents. And we ask a series of eight questions. Each question has a score ranging between zero and four. And this really relates to how deeply invested companies are in understanding biodiversity mainstreaming. So for example, um, at number five, in terms of, of how well companies can strategize, is do they have KPIs to, to actually assess their biodiversity performance? Um, do they implement biodiversity policies? Question six. Do they disclose those policies? Question seven. And then the last one is, do they have active systems to monitor and improve their impacts? What we did is we then rated every kind of publicly available document we could find and came up with a score for each company. And we then approached every company individually to actually assess whether they had extra information to share and to start that, that conversation. What's interesting is a lot of the companies came back saying that they have no relationship to, to biodiversity at all. Um, we shouldn't bother them in the future. And uh, it just goes to show how even some companies with sustainability departments have no real bigger picture grasp on this. And a lot of that is easy to understand um, in terms of our socioeconomic kind of crises that we have um, in this country and in developing countries in general. But however, there has still been some improvement over time. So this is the results of the 2020 report. Um, this is very much in um, final draft stage at the moment. So this is a sneak preview of some of our our results. We um, really had a look at all 327 JSE listed companies and 27 SOEs. And this graph basically shows the number of companies per industry. So from energy, um, basic materials, through to finance, through to health, how many of them scored anything above zero for our questionnaire? Uh, and you can see it's very industry uh, specific. Basic materials, so your mining and forestry and agriculture companies, for example, um, over 50% of them had some policy related to, to biodiversity. Completely understandable, as they have direct needs on, on biodiversity um, products. Finance, for example, however, had very little um, kind of company engagement with, with biodiversity. And considering that the finance sector is said to have some of the biggest impacts on, on nature by financing um, nature degradatory um, services, that is quite scary. Um, also, for example, real estate, um, actual physical properties in the ground, very easy to understand how, how that may impact on, on nature, very little engagement. So it's, it does paint a, a bleak picture in South Africa. Um, and we're working with these companies to, to try and help and improve their scores. Thankfully, the scores have been steadily improving over the last three years since we've been doing this. And hopefully this actually is a, is a call to action um, for a lot of companies. And related to the poll earlier, um, hopefully there's also pressure being put on companies from either consumers with the conscious kind of consumer movement or, or shareholders and investors asking questions at, at AGMs, asking questions of, of companies about their policies. And this is very much not 
us trying to attack companies, but to to start really broadening the horizons of companies, both with sustainability departments and those without, to consolidate their impacts. Just out of out of interest, the the top three companies for 2020. Um, number one was was Anglo American total scores. Number two was uh, Woolworths, and number three was Richmond. Three different sectors, all engaging with biodiversity at a fairly great level, which is great to see. We want to move, however, beyond just understanding whether a company has a biodiversity policy to actually whether companies have an impact on biodiversity. How much um, do they impact biodiversity? And this is where biodiversity footprinting comes in. And it, it was born out of a need for standardized measurement methodology for biodiversity impacts. Related right back to that question of how do we actually even measure our impacts? Greenhouse gases are, are fairly simple. We can measure emissions, we can calculate them back to, to metric tons of carbon. But how do you actually measure how much a company such as Woolworths impacts the environment with all of their supply chains, all of their consumers? How do they actually ensure that um, downstream? So for example, their products, how are their products disposed of? Um, they have very little control sometimes over how their products are disposed. And is that related to their, to their impacts on nature? Are they responsible for that? And so the biodiversity footprint movement has been increasing steadily. And we regard a biodiversity footprint as the total biodiversity impacts generated by an organization, but it can also be a, pro a project or a product. Companies can generate both positive and negative footprints. So negative being a state change where you've reduced biodiversity. And for example, you've put up a building. Um, in kind of virgin territory. You can also have a positive footprint. So you've cleared alien trees in your vicinity and that has increased biodiversity. And so it's, it's looking at these net impacts, which has become very important. And this is done in terms of footprinting in two ways. One is either a high level impact modeling approach. Um, and that's generally looking at large sectors and the finance industry often does this when looking at whether to finance projects or not. And the other is site-based impact assessment of actual changes on the ground. Um, and this is really the, the kind of approach we took as the Endangered Wildlife Trust in developing a biodiversity footprint accounting tool, which is known as our biological diversity protocol. This is really to try and help companies understand their, their footprints in a meaningful and rigorous way. And what we do is we have a look at both footprints on ecosystems. And this is generally the measure of a kind of a surface area adjusted for condition or habitat integrity. We also look at species, however, because species are, are very important. And for example, as you would know with birds being very mobile species, it's, it's quite a difficult task sometimes to assess impacts on, on some of those, those populations. So what we actually do is we have a look at things like the habitat size um, adjusted for the number of population and how much is available to them and what population there is. And Karina will be chatting a bit about this and how this works in, um, in practice in a bit. But I, I want to unpack this biological diversity protocol a bit, because I think we've moved from seeing that there's a need in terms of sexual engagement, but also this is a tool which companies can use to specifically measure their impact. So we developed it here as a multi-collaborative process of more than 40 co-authors and contributors developed over a two year period. And it is based on seven accounting and reporting principles based on the greenhouse gas protocol, which a lot of companies will be familiar with. What really makes this important and unique is that it's any industry can use it and any value chain can use it. So you can have a look at direct operations only, or you can assess upstream your suppliers' footprints and consolidate them to your group. 
It looks at net impacts, both positive and negative. That's incredibly important on all ecosystems and material species. It simply would be impossible to measure impacts on, on all species. And so what we look at is we, we look at material species such as those that are of conservation status, which ones are threatened, and also which ones are um, really will cost money for the company to, to either manage or may actually produce revenue for the company. Um, and this is also related to how companies impact species. So we look at those that are impacted most by, by a company. So we do this kind of accounting system um, where we look at the species and different ecosystems. And what makes the protocol unique, if there's any accountants in the audience, um, I'm not an accountant, but I, I've wrapped my head around this. It's based on double entry bookkeeping which shows both accumulated impacts over time, so it produces a balance sheet, and also net impacts over a specific period, um, so a profit and loss statement. And this is incredibly important because companies may take over a, a stand of, of area or an ecosystem and want to measure the changes that they've, they've made over time after acquisition. But also it's important to know what does that actually mean in terms of net impacts. If a mine, for example, we've got some very old mines um, in this, this country and they've been passed from, from company to company over, over hundreds of years. We want to know, for example, how much responsibility um, that company may have for the last kind of year or two or since takeover. But also how much has that actually changed from the state, the original state of biodiversity? How much cumulative impacts have there been? Um, has a change from a grassland state to a factory. So it's really important to know that we're doing quite complicated science-based accounting in the background, um, having a look at, at these, these journal entries. And just, this is kind of a brief overview of the actual steps taken, just to show some of the kind of steps. And number one is we would set the assessment boundaries such as the organizational and value chain. Are we doing downstream? Are we looking at recycling of, of products? We then develop our impact inventory on ecosystem types and species. We assess the impacts. And this is both via desktop analysis using any available data. So for example, we would often have remote sense data. So satellite images, which we can have a look at different ecosystems. Uh, a lot of companies may have environmental management reports or environmental impact assessments. And so there has already been field work done. And so we can use that data. We don't want to have this as a completely rigorous process, which will take years to do. We need to be able to assess impacts quickly, but also really accurately using accounting and ecological principles. We then measure our biodiversity gains and losses. So changes to the state of, of ecosystems, such as a, a wetland being improved by a company, for example. We do our accounting kind of journal entries. Um, then obviously we go through a validation and verification process where we um, consult with the companies themselves as well as externals. And we can then enable the company to report on their biodiversity footprints. And from that, they can then have management plans in place in terms of biodiversity. Now this, I've kind of rushed through this a bit and this, I'm more than happy to, to answer questions about how we do this because I think it's, it's important to show this in practice. And so what I'd like to chat about actually is a case study we did uh, together with ESCOM. Um, ESCOM being a really big landholder um, in, in the country and responsible for a lot of, of land and we really wanted to have a look at two very different sites and see whether we could employ the footprint uh, at both, both areas. So at Siri on the west coast and in Gula, kind of in the Drakensberg grassland area. Um, I'm going to be chatting about this and I'm packing about this um, in a while. And I actually wanted to encourage ESCOM to also give their viewpoint on why this would be important to them. Why, why would ESCOM care? 
um, about biodiversity and actually measuring it accurately and also reporting upon it. We're, we're very lucky that ESCOM has agreed to publish these case studies as publicly available documents, which really shows how seriously they, they take this. But don't take my word from it. Um, here is Kishelin Chetty of ESCOM chatting about this. So I'm going to hand over to him in a pre-recorded video. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great opportunity for me to be with you tonight to discuss ESCOM and the Biological Diversity Protocol. Just want to thank Gabby and Karina for inviting me tonight. So what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and take you through why ESCOM have got involved with the biodiversity or biological diversity protocol and exactly what it means for us and what we think it will lead to in terms of the management of our business going forward. I know that a lot of you are already aware, but in case you're not, ESCOM is a 100% state-owned electricity utility within South Africa, supplies approximately 90% of uh, electricity across the country, and additionally around 40 to 45 percent of electricity across Africa. We are quite a large organization with um, a significant generation mix and that generation mix is made up of coal and nuclear, pump storage, hydro, gas, wind and solar photovoltaic and linking all of that together is quite an extensive and expansive transmission and distribution network. So with an organization that has as much infrastructure as ESCOM does, there's a need to ensure that we manage our activities within the environment. Now to do this, ESCOM has a series of, of um, policies and, and procedures set up and strategies set up within the organization to ensure that we effectively integrate environmental management into our business practices through a, a number of systems. Two of the key strategic objectives within our environmental management strategy have been pulled out on your screen and I've specifically utilized these because these assist us in, in um, putting forward our motivation towards the biological diversity protocol. These include reducing the environmental footprint of the ESCOM activities and ensuring that ESCOM is an environmentally responsible and sustainable organization into the future. Now, I discussed a lot about um, environmental management, when, but when it comes to biodiversity, what's important for everyone to recognize is that biodiversity is mainstreamed into the ESCOM business. So it is a part of, of the business. But for someone in my position, it's important that I am continuously trying to motivate as to why biodiversity in a power utility is, an, is a key component of day-to-day of -day activities. And Six of the drivers that assist me with, with mainstreaming and providing the motivation to mainstream biodiversity into the business include cost to company. So where can biodiversity help us uh, save some, some money and can, it actually, can we actually benefit an income from it? Corporate image, would engaging in, in biodiversity and conservation assist us in improving ESCOM's corporate image? Through communities, are we able to enhance the livelihoods of, of communities? through compliance, um, we need a license to operate. More often than not, for a lot of our sites, there are key biodiversity requirements, so we need to manage those requirements in order to have the license to operate. And then uh, continuity of electricity generation supply. There are a number of, of wildlife that actually do disrupt some of our ability to supply electricity, either by um, electrocutions that occur on, occur on transformers, or electrocutions that might occur on power lines that leads towards us uh, not being able to deliver our core service. So managing for those biodiversity initiatives enables us to actually contribute and ensure that our, our core business um, operates effectively. And then lastly, something that is important and, and I'll explain why it is important is that conservation is is a key component of what ESCOM tries to drive within South Africa. So we really subscribe to the national strategies and the conservation plans across the provinces. And um, the reason for that is that at a, 
at a group strategic level and at a management and operational level, biodiversity has been mainstreamed into a number of our key strategies and policies and procedures. And um, we're able to, to actually then uh, put forward management and, and um, ensure that it leads towards successful biodiversity implementation, both for the organization, but that it also contributes towards a lot of South Africa's biodiversity goals and targets. Now, when the Endangered Wildlife Trust approached ESCOM with the Biological Diversity Protocol, um, some of the key things that we took out of that is that we recognized if we were to, to engage within this protocol, the BDP, um, we would actually improve or potentially improve a number of, of items. And some of those in, included um, a need within the organization for us to improve our biodiversity key performance indicators, to ensure that we could actually consolidate biodiversity impact data across our sites, which would enable more effective decision-making, uh, strategy management, and ensure that we have the right budgets to manage for, for whatever strategy we've put out. And then in, in addition to that, the BDP allows us to actually communicate those activities related to biodiversity, both internally and externally. Two of the sites we selected were the Siri Wind Energy Facility, which is in Friedendal on the West Coast, and um, the Angula Pump Storage Scheme, which is separated on the Drakensberg Escarpment between Free State and KZN. And we selected these two sites because they're quite rich in terms of biodiversity. They have a lot of information um, that we could contribute towards the BDP case studies that um, the Endangered Wildlife Trust were, were putting forward. And likewise, we have actual conservation teams on the ground who undertake uh, field monitoring and collect data for us, um, which includes an Endangered Wildlife Trust team at the Siri Wind Energy Facility and the BirdLife South Africa team, the Angula Pump Storage Scheme, which is now a formally declared nature reserve called the Angula Nature Reserve and also has been designated as a Ramsar site. So um, these two sites were selected and Karina is definitely going to take you through a little bit more of, of what's happened uh, within the Angula Pump Storage Scheme specifically how that case study unfolded and some of the, the core scientific data that went behind uh, producing the result for that site. Thank you so much for uh, the information and um, the opportunity to present and we look forward to a really good discussion tonight. Good evening ladies and gentlemen. Fab, I am now going to hand over to, to Karina to give us a bit more detail onto that. Thanks, Karina. Hi, everyone. Had a little bit of a problem there, but um, yeah, thank you so much, Gabby. And as you said, I will go through the Ingula Nature Reserve as a case study on how we did the assessments um, that we eventually gave back to the Endangered Wildlife Trust to um, work into their plan. So for those of, who you, those of you who are new to the conservation conversations and haven't heard me speak about the Ingula Pump Storage Scheme and Ingula Nature Reserve yet, um, both of my colleagues did mention that Ingula is located on the eastern escarpment between the Free State and KwaZulu-Natal. And this location is a, a very, provides a very unique um, combination of habitats in that you have the high altitude grassland and wetland system in the Free State. Then you have the escarpment in the middle with indigenous forest pockets with yellowwood trees. And then you have the slightly lower elevated um, grasslands in KwaZulu-Natal with some wetlands. And then you have these two major dams, the Bedford and the Bromach Dam, connected by underground tunnels uh, that function as the Ingula Pumped Storage Scheme. So for those of you who don't know how an, a pumped storage scheme works, it's basically a large battery 
using some electricity during the lower demand periods of the day or the week, and then using that electricity to pump the water up the, upstream, up the mountain to the top dam where it is stored and then regenerated during the high demand periods of the day or the week um, so that we can all have electricity when we need it. So how BirdLife South Africa and Melbourne Wetland Trust became involved was during the construction of these dams, or it became apparent that when they were going to construct these dams, a section of wetland was going to be lost. And it was very important wetland to us because of the presence of the critically endangered white-winged flufftail. So we became involved in 2003 when the Ngula partnership was established. Um, in 2018, as Kishel and Chetty mentioned, we became a, a provincial nature reserve in both the Free State and KwaZulu-Natal provinces. Pre uh, earlier this year, we were designated as South Africa's 27th wetland of international importance in, according to the Ramsar Convention. So this is major milestones in the project, which is governed by uh, the Ingula Partnership Steering Committee, comprised of all three um, partners in the partnership with the shared conservation objective to monitor and minimize the environmental impact throughout the project construction, which ended in 2017 and beyond, which is where we are now. So, um, the Biodiversity Pro Disclosure Project Protocol comprises of two approaches. You've got the ecosystem approach and the species approach, as Dr. Gabby mentioned earlier. Um, the ecosystem approach is mainly focused on looking after the, the habitats, if we can call it like that. And then the species, we kind of disregard the habitats and we only look at the population of the species. Um, I'm saying kind of because there is a, a, a side to the species approach where you do look at the available habitat, but having data of Ingula Nature Reserve and bird data, biodiversity data from 2003, um, we opted for the species population um, data with regards to our species. So I will take you through these uh, two approaches one by one for the Ingula Nature Reserve and how we came to the conclusions that we came to at the end. So starting at the ecosystems, um, as mentioned Ingula has quite a number of ecosystems. Um, at the top we have the wetlands at Ingula which for practicality we divided into the top wetlands which is the uh, eastern fr temperate freshwater wetlands and the bottom wetlands on KwaZulu-Natal, uh, which is the temperate grassy wetlands. Um, this was divided in, in that manner because the two sites quite have slightly different climatic conditions and also a slight dif difference in um, how they are managed. So Moving on to the grasslands, we have four different grassland types on Ningula. The four grasslands are according to the vegetation classification for South Africa. And the four types are the low escarpment moist grassland, which is the grassland on the escarpment, eastern free state sandy grassland, which is also a threatened type of, of grassland, Basutu montane shrubland is also threatened, and then Northern KwaZulu-Natal moist grassland. Uh, moving on to our trees, um, we divided that into the Northern Afro temperate forests, which are the forest pockets. If you look on this photo, you can see the forest pockets on the escarpment. Those are indigenous yellowwood forests. And then the second um, classification we used for trees are our woodland systems. These are mainly riparian woodlands or areas where indigenous um, trees have started encroaching into the grasslands. They do occur naturally, so we do not manage them at this stage, but we are keeping an eye on them to prevent them from becoming a problem. 
And then lastly, as a natural ecosystem, we do have these large dams. Um, the Bedford and Brahmuk Dam are both regarded as natural ecosystems since they do have um, biodiversity or fish life in them, but they are also regarded as artificial. So we did not do too much about them. Uh, they were constructed, so we, our focus were mainly on the wetlands, grasslands and forests. So for each of these ecosystems, we created a condition scoring system where there's a, zero con a score of zero would be completely transformed or loss of that habitat type. Um, for example, the wetlands that were lost due to um, the construction of the dam. And a score of five would be completely natural or pristine habitat. So there has been no change in the ecosystem structure. And that is very hard to find in South Africa and in the world right now. So the highest score we were able to give to um, our ecosystems on Ingula was a four, which is largely natural. Um, with small changes, but the ecosystem functions are still completely intact. Um, so what we did then was plot this on a map, such as the one on your right, um, showing the different ecosystems. So there's the different grassland types, the trees are indicated in green, but also showing all the artificial structures, all the man-made um, structures that, that were constructed, that includes roads, uh, the off-road tracks, buildings, um, power lines, et cetera. All of these areas were then excluded from our calculations of the condition score per um, ecosystem because they are completely transformed. They all counted into the zero category. And then we worked on that to produce a condition map for the Ingula Nature Reserve and um, the area owned by ESCOM, the community areas owned by ESCOM. Um, for each ecosystem type, we used a different uh, method to get to these scores. Um, I'm not going into much detail here, but for example, for grasslands and wetlands, we use the normalized difference vegetation index which gives an idea of, um, of the greenness or the health of a, of a plant. Um, so what we did was we took a season's data and we put that, uh, we selected the greenest pixel uh, from the satellite imagery. Greenest pixel is the one, um, for example, if the site is overgrazed, the pixels are about 30 by 30 meters. So, if a site is severely overgrazed, that pixel will not become as green as a site which is properly managed. That's just an example. Um, so we then run it through our system and or through the processes and we came up with this map showing the condition scores of both the wetlands and the grasslands of Ingula. You can see that the, the grasslands and wetlands in the middle where the dams were constructed are showed, shown as completely transformed. And the community areas, which does have a little um, higher grazing intensity than the nature reserve, are slightly more modified um, than the rest of the nature reserve. So that's what we did with the grassland and wetlands. For the trees, we ran a different algorithm, identifying just the, the areas uh, where wattle trees or invasive alien plants were um, encroaching into our trees or indigenous trees. And you can see there's a faint red line around some of these forest patches. That red line is the wattle trees that are encroaching. Um, so using a classification system for the, for, for the forests combined with this com um, wattle tree encroachment, then came up with our condition score for both the forest and our wetland um, ecosystems. Um, based on this, then we could we could work out or calculate the uh, the size of 
of the area um, per condition score and then uh, report that back to EWT. Um, so moving on to the species, Ingula is home to quite a high number of biodiversity. Um, as you can see, we've got currently got a 341 bird species recorded since we've started, 24 of which are threatened, uh, 35 mammals, 36 herpetofauna, so that's your amphibians and reptiles, uh, 74 butterflies and 12 different types of orchids. Um, so although the orchids fall more into the ecosystems category, this just goes to show the massive biodiversity that we do have in a largely uh, wetland and grassland um, site. Um, so with that big biodiversity, we had to select our priority species because you cannot um, possibly work out the population sizes for all of these species. So the criteria used was the conservation status of the species immediately narrowed the birds down from 341 to 24. Um, the higher threat status the birds had, the lower or the higher score they got. For example, a bearded vulture in South Africa is critically endangered, so they scored the highest. Um, whereas a blue crane, although uh, threatened globally, is only near threatened in South Africa, they scored a little lower. Um, so the next one is population assessment or monitoring and the capacity to do both. Um, Obviously, you have to be able to count these birds and actually monitor their progress over time. Um, so as you can see, most of the birds that we have on here are quite conspicuous, big ones that aren't um, easy to miss. And um, this just, <laughs> I, I like to use the example of a, a, a white-winged flufftail, although it's critically endangered in, um, globally. It's really hard to actually find these birds, as most of you know. Um, it would cost quite a lot to put up um, the equipment in the wetlands to find them, and then to count them accurately would take a lot of time and effort. So it just doesn't become feasible using them as an indicator species or a priority species for a project like this. And then the third and fourth criteria we used are the likelihood of impact or the and the severity of impact. Um, the likelihood of impacts are, for example, how likely is a secretary bird to fly into a power line compared to a yellow-breasted pipit? Um, and then what if they do encounter this impact, how severe will that be for the species? Um, on site, based on our previous knowledge, we knew that our secretary birds, each uh, phase, each lost a partner, um, and it took them more than a year to find a new partner and start breeding again. So how severe is that impact? If, if you lose one of these birds, how will that affect the population in general? So our nine priority species that we decided to work on, was the yellow-breasted pipit, bearded vulture, secretary bird, gray crowned crane, wattled crane, African marsh harrier, oruby, uh, gray rebuck, and a mountain reedbuck. So regarding the birds, um, we have quite a database of information that we can work with. From BirdLife South Africa side, we do monthly transects, walked and driven transects to do diversity monitoring. Um, so we have quite a good idea of what birds occur there um, and where they occur mostly. Um, and then we also do seasonal breeding monitoring for our threatened birds that do use Ingula to breed on. Um, so we also have that historical database on how many um, pairs or um, birds we had in the past compared to how many we have now. Um, this in detail or in-depth monitoring we've done over the uh, past about 10-20 years was, um, has enabled us to 
to really narrow down um, which areas a bird occur in, how big an area they need, and then also how densely their nest can be within a certain year. Um, it's also enabled us to, to develop uh, species action plans for, among other, the wattled crane and yellow-breasted pipit. So we've got this, this in-depth knowledge of site and our birds there that can really be used well in this situation. And the same goes for the mammals. Although BirdLife South Africa don't work with the mammals per se, we do record them when we, when we do see them. But we have Nambiti General Conservation Services on site and they have a horse team uh, that spends most of the day out in the field collecting, especially this data, um, looking for snares, etc., doing a little bit of security but recording specifically all the, uh, all the mammal species that they do record. Some of the birds as well, we are trying to train them on bird identification and that's going really well as well. So, but they are mainly focused at uh, identifying and counting the mammal species on Ingula, um, leading us with a really good idea of, of where these mammals occur, which of them and how many of them we have on site. So combining both of our approaches, ours and the horseman's approaches, um, we can really get, get some good information. Um, for the species side of the biodiversity disclosure project or the protocol, um, we did a lot of species specific research on each of our priority species, each of those nine, those nine. Um, I researched patch size requirements, um, so how big an area do they need, nesting densities, etc., so that I really got a good idea of, of what kind of habitat do each of these um, species need to have a viable population or successfully raise a chick um, or a lamb in that, for that matter. Um, and then we also have our vast site knowledge. Um, over 10 years of monitoring for both us and the horseman team, we have these databases available for, for all of us to work on. And then the third thing we used in, this, in figuring out what populations in Kula could um, call, be home to, or you know, could house, um, was using habitat suitability modeling. I'm not going to go into too much detail on how that works as it could get quite technical, but if you are interested in how habitat suitability modeling works and you missed it previously, you can go on YouTube and find the uh, administrative presentation for conservation conversations um, and, and have a look at that. So basically what it does though, is it identifies the patches of habitat using satellite images to um, find out whether these, uh, this habitat does meet the specific requirements per species. Are the grass, for example, short enough or um, are there few enough or more than enough trees for the species, species et cetera. And using all three of these combinations or a com um, yeah, combination of all three of these aspects, we can then have a, an informed estimate on what's the current population size, how many breeding pairs are there on site, and then also project this into how many can we realistically expect the Angula Nature Reserve to house? Um, how many Orobi can we have on site without um, completely overgrazing or creating such a competition um, between them that their numbers become, yeah, that their numbers start declining again, etc. So what's the optimal number of species or number of number of individuals per species that we can house on Angula? And all of this information we then fed back to the Endangered Wildlife Trust. Um, who then took this, this data, 
did all the statistics that I'm sure um, Gabby will tell you about right now. And this is how we, we can then protect the whole ecosystem and all of the environment, um, especially on the Angula Nature Reserve in a combined effort. So Gabby, you can take over again. Thanks, Karina. And I am so pleased you showed some photos of birds because uh, I haven't had more than one bird photo in my entire presentation yet. So, so pleased about that. Um, just gonna reshare my presentation. Perfect. And so I think, I think this gives you some insight into what practically on the ground this really means for, for biodiversity footprinting from very high level kind of concepts in terms of accounting and, and drawing frameworks around companies and their supply chains, but also really being out in the field and, and collecting that site specific data, which is so incredibly important, particularly in biodiverse rich countries um, that we're lucky to find ourselves in here. And so that really does show the one approach of biodiversity footprinting and how much science goes into it and how much field work goes into it to actually assess these sorts of uh, journal entries. And so the, the case studies are available online, as I said, and there's lots of tables in terms of the accounting and condition scores and lots of beautiful maps, such as the um, one here on the right, which goes into um, the crowned, gray crowned crane kind of habitats. But ultimately, all of the science leads to some fairly nice numbers. And I say nice because they are rigorously backed by a lot of data, but are very simple and simple enough for board level to, to understand and for investors to understand. And so this here is the, the final account for the two sites in terms of accumulated positive biodiversity footprints in hectare equivalents and negative biodiversity footprints in hectare equivalents. So for Angula, which Karina um, kind of gave us some details about, you can see there's actually about 50% of the total site managed by, by ESCOM is positive footprint. And so is, is really that reserve which we're talking about. 50% is, is negative or 48%. For Siri um, on the West Coast, if you cast your mind back, completely different ecosystem type, very arid, different species, not a lot of information around some of the species. We weren't lucky to have all of the historical data which, which bird life has been collecting after, after all these years. But interestingly enough, their footprint is 76% positive and 23% negative. What the, the take home message here, however, is that these footprints for two very different sites with two very different accounting kind of journal entries, you can actually scale them up to a group level. And for ESCOM then to be able to have a reporting line in their, their report saying, they have 60% of biodiversity footprint across the sites assessed, which is positive. And they can then set a KPI and set that as an indicator saying, we're gonna have management plans in place and hold ourselves accountable. We're not gonna drop below this. Um, or for some companies, for example, a lot of the mining companies are now having net positive impact policies. And so they actually will say that they're going to improve their footprint. And so this gives a, a very kind of nice way for, for companies to report and disclose and measure their biodiversity performance. And so we've moved from can biodiversity even be measured, what indicators do we use, to some rigorous science and site-based field work, to scaling up to group-based indicators. And the next Point then in terms of the mainstreaming journey is then having biodiversity strategies and action plans to, to improve that. So we need to move beyond measuring, um, of which we can see companies are, are still trying to develop policies, never mind measure, and then actually into strategies and action plans and to move along the biodiversity journey. But 
I think case studies such as as this from ESCOM are are fairly um, inspirational to, to other countries to show that they too can can measure their their impacts and disclose. And as I think there were some mentions in the, the chat around other approaches, there's lots of biodiversity frameworks out there, national capital counting uh, framework being one of them. Um, as long as they're being used rigorously and companies can set science-based targets, this is moving us all in the right direction. However, as my kind of closing slide, I, I just want to point out that taking the results from our sector-specific um, analysis of the JSC, for example, where basic materials was really the only industry engaging at a, at a level which is, is somewhat reasonable to actually affect change. This is from legislation. This is very much because companies have no need to uh, disclose or measure their, their biodiversity policies unless government e either uh, legislates them to, or there is enough consumer pressure for the social license to, to operate. And so hopefully this will change. Um, and hopefully this will, will be a, a kind of positive story to, to tell for companies that are showing the way of how to do this voluntarily. And I say this because um, this year, which has now been pushed to, to next year, we have the COP15, which is the Convention of Biological Diversity, which is going to be hosted in Kunming, China. And here is where global leaders will be setting their targets. There is a talk of a 30 by 30 target where we need minimum of 30% of the planet's um, cover or area conserved or under protection by 2030 in order to avoid catastrophic um, loss of ecosystems and functionality. And so we're, we're partnering with several organizations and there's a lot of, of impetus being put onto policymakers to really accelerate business action. Um, so Business for Nature, for example, have put up their website here are working to try and align um, the policies for both nature, people and climate. All three are interlinked and all three cannot be separated um, in, if we want to really make a difference. However, we also need to think about how we value and embed nature in decision-making and disclosure. Uh, it's some approaches that have been, for example, taking a financial approach and actually valuing in terms of monetary value nature. This has, has difficulties around it in terms of how you actually value systems and what their, their value is to, to people or to companies. Um, and so we need to rethink the entire ethos around incentive mechanisms and finances. And there's a lot of movement happening in this. There's a newly established task force for nature related financial disclosures. And banks and finance companies are also now getting onto the bandwagon and having a look at how they um, have subsidies and how they actually value some of their, their investments. And all of this should eventually lead to empowering everyone, um, both consumers, um, such as all of you to actually give you information so that you can assess companies and their, their impacts on, on nature in an understandable and scientifically rigorous way to avoid greenwashing. A lot of companies are, are still very much in the, the phase of greenwashing and just putting out statements and having very little policies or measurements to back those up. But we're, we're hopefully working towards a, a brighter future where we're engaging with corporates um, in this space with both consumers and policymakers. And so I, I invite anyone really um, to have a look at our website where we have the BD protocol published and we have our mainstreaming documents published and our 2020 report will hopefully go up there in the next month or so. And you can then have a look at all of the JS listed companies and their performance. Um, and please feel free to, to email me any questions you may have, or would, if you'd like more information about the National Biodiversity and Business Network. And just in closing, I'd like to say thank you. Um, thank you to all of you who have listened and kind of joined this, this conversation. And thank you to companies who are making a difference. And thank you to companies who don't even know how to think about nature, because we need to start, and we need to start somewhere in order for us to, to preserve all the way down to, to fluff tails. 
Um, so I'm going to stop talking here and hand over back to, to Melissa. So thank you. Thank you, Gabby and Karina. That was absolutely fascinating. And I think hopefully we'll have given everyone something really interesting to chew on when it comes to thinking about how we consume products and how businesses operate uh, in relation to biodiversity. So before we dive into the range of questions which are starting to slide into our Q&A box, just to remind everybody as you exit tonight's webinar, there is a post webinar poll. Please do give that an answer. It shouldn't take you more than two minutes. And we really do value your feedback on those post webinar surveys. We've also got an amazing talk coming up next week from Nature's Valley Trust's Dr. Brittany Aronser, all about shorebirds. So do be sure to tune in with us next week again, same time, seven o'clock on your Zoom screens. But let's dive into some of the questions coming through. And Gabby, I've got one for you. Obviously, a lot of our audience always ask us, what can I, as the person sitting at home, do to benefit conservation? And I think Tonight, you've really touched on the, the power that every single person listening in tonight has to influence how businesses operate in relation to biodiversity. So if you had to give everyone tuning in tonight one bit of advice in terms of their ability to help mainstream biodiversity in business, what can they do to, to promote that? It's a fantastic question. I think the, the rise of consumer activism and conscious investors has shown the power that, that people have, um, such as the plastic um, straw ban. It came out of the middle of nowhere. Um, is it going to be particularly effective in terms of the bigger picture? I think only time will tell, but that was born out of a group of individuals really asking questions over, over this and, and putting their, their money where their mouths are. And so the number one piece of advice is really just ask the questions. Um, ask questions of, of companies um, that you're either investing in if they actually value their impacts, ask questions of, of you know, kind of retailers. Um, yes, you've got a plastic kind of policy, but what is your policy for your downstream uh, users? What is your policy for your upstream suppliers? So really, if we, are, if we start asking these questions, we highlight this, that we're moving beyond measuring carbon, we're moving beyond measuring water. We need to create a holistic approach to biodiversity. I think that will, Will hopefully start some movement. Absolutely and, and touching on that concept that you spoke about in terms of greenwashing, obviously we do know that there are culprits out there that are fail, famous or infamous for their ability to greenwash and appear to be very environmentally conscious. Where can people sort of report greenwashing as, as per se? Is there any way that we can flag that? Is that something we need to address and make available to people to report? How do we deal with this whole greenwashing concept? That's, that's an incredibly interesting question um, because I don't think there are any real rigorous ways to, to report um, companies which are greenwashing. Um, I think there's a lot of movement in terms of, um, for example, the, the group called Just Share who are actively engaged in um, assessing companies' policies and asking questions at AGMs. Um, and so I think just even just looking at the, the policies and the integrated reports, it takes time and, it, and, and kind of leads to a lot of work being done and having a look at whether com companies actually put their, their respective policies where their mouths are. Um, but no, there is no way for us to, to hold com companies responsible as consumers at this point. Maybe something we all need to look at. But uh, onto some more questions. And Karina, this one's coming for you. Uh, our eagle-eyed Eleanor has asked, are there measures being taken to control or even eradicate the alien wattle species that are encroaching on the natural forests of Angula? Thanks so much, Eleanor. I appreciate the question. Yes, we are continuously busy um, taking or clearing the alien uh, plants on Angula and especially the wattles. Um, we are currently working with the... Uh, working up, working for water, work, working on water, um, group from uh, government, and uh, they are taking a uh, whole catchment catchment approach. So it doesn't help to just clear alien uh, trees locally. You have to take a bigger approach because the seeds just get washed down with the water. 
with Angula being so dependent on water, we often get these flare-ups coming out of the dams again and just spreading again into our areas. So they have started at the top of the catchment, which luckily is not that far since the, um, the catchment edge is on the escarpment. Um, so they've started at the top and started clearing all the wattle trees on Angula. Um, but this is very much an ongoing process and yeah, lots have already been done and we are hoping to, to clear some more soon. Brilliant. Thanks, Karina. Yes. And I think your maps really highlighted the, the ability for these remote sensing tools to identify these challenging sites. And a huge congrats to you and Robin and the rest of the team who've developed those indices that we can track what's going on on the ground. Now, Gabby, this next one's coming to you and it's from Alistair Campbell, who knows Ingula all too well, spending much of his time there in the previous decade. But uh, Alistair's asking, are the two approaches comparable? Uh, he's saying um, they may have been interested, it might have been interesting to see the comparison between the two assessments carried, considering that Ingula has had such a large historical database to play with and series a relatively new site. Can you speak to the to sort of the ability to compare these two sites? Yeah, and I think that's that really is insightful because what what the protocol actually tries to do is take on the ground site data, be that um, and what is available, and do a gap analysis to actually first as first step show what isn't available and what data do we need. But we don't want to ever be hampered by by that so that we can't produce an account. So the, the accounts are still produced in exactly the same way. So the generic accounting framework using different data. So your ecosystem types adjusted for condition and your material species. And we also believe in, in complete transparency and accountability. And so where we don't have enough information on species that is noted. And so that then will hopefully encourage the um, teams either on the ground or at a later stage for the next kind of updated account, because this should be a recurring process to collect more of that data. There are gonna be many instances where data is, is not readily available and not um, historically bound. And so it shouldn't stop us, but it should be a starting point to assess what we do know. Absolutely. And uh, I am conscious of time, we have gone 20 minutes over. So Gabby, I'm going to do one more question for you. And uh, this is from Esther. And she'd just like to hear your take on offsets and how we can use things like biodiversity protocols to identify offsets and then obviously monitor them through time and counter the negative impacts of some industries. Would you like to speak to that, please? Yeah, another another really great question. And it shows really the, the kind of nexus between policy and, and business and incentives. So biodiversity offsets for, for those that aren't aware are often occur um, when a company is or a proposal goes through to for a development and following a mitigation hierarchy where um, a company is, met, is first meant to um, avoid impacts and then reduce impacts and minimize impacts and then potentially restore the next point, if development is absolutely necessary to take place, um, offsets can occur where a company is then um, legally required because they're a legal um, entity to actually offset their impacts on a particular ecosystem with preserving or conserving the same type of ecosystem using the equivalency principle in potentially a different area. And I think the equivalency in principle is a really important one to note because a patch of montane grassland is not equal to a patch of high felt grassland. Um, never mind a patch of, of Karoo kind of, um, you know, speckworm area. Um, never mind Fainbos. Let's not even go into Fainbos and how that is not equivalent anywhere. So that is a really incredibly important point because. Offsets are, are sometimes used in the world as a way of greenwashing. And there's certain cases from certain countries where that's been, they've been shown to not be particularly effective for uh, conservation. And what the BD protocol explicitly tries to do is it has a look at every single ecosystem entity in and of itself and have a look at the impacts on that. And so if, if offsets are potentially needed, we can measure those 
and measure the type of habitat that it is and how much of it is, is actually impacted. Um, and my last point on this being that there's a lot of movement in the space to have voluntary offsets now, as opposed to legally required offsets for pre-development. So post-developments, we should actually have uh, offsets that are voluntary where companies can conserve areas that are already impacted upon. But for that to happen, we need financial incentives. And that is a whole other kind of discussion, which I, I, I won't go into tonight. But there is movement in the space, but it's very difficult to, to articulate because there's no policy driven down yet. Absolutely. And I think that's a great way to wrap up tonight's webinar. Uh, Gabby, Karina, thank you both so much. I'll give you a chance just to say any closing sentiments before we wrap up tonight's webinar. We'll start with Karina and then Gabby, I'll let you have the, the closing statement. So Karina, over to you. Thanks so much, Melissa. And yeah, from my side, I would just like to, to thank EWT as well for for doing this work. Um, it was quite interesting from my side to, to put the site knowledge that we've gathered over so many years uh, to such a good use. Um, so very thank, very much thank you for that. And um, thank you for everyone who listened. I really enjoyed talking to you tonight. Thank you, Karina. Gabby, over to you. Thanks, Melissa. And, and yeah, thanks, Karina, as well. It, it's it's so insightful to actually have um, that data on the ground and be able to see photos of people actually doing field work, which then relates into a counting journal that sits on my desktop. Um, and I think a lot, of, a lot of you in the audience can probably relate to that. Uh, and so my, my kind of take home message is, is to enjoy the habitats that, that we have and to go out there and, and explore and and look at them and then also look at them with a critical eye in terms of industries that surround some of these great areas which you you may find yourself in um, everything is is connected and what happens um, in a river catchment for example by an industry may very well be influencing the the bird that you are looking at and so just ask questions um, i think photos are all um, very very good at at that and uh, yeah, just thank you everyone for, for listening and thank you for the opportunity to chat. And thanks ESCOM for, for supporting us um, and, and really helping us out with getting to the next phase and, and showing that they can be a leader in, in this space. Um, and thanks to BirdLife as well for, for just being just great partners to work with. Thank you so much, Gabby, and thank you, Karina. And as you said, we, we are all connected. And given that it is Heritage Day this week, I hope everyone will go out there and give a nod to the incredible biodiversity that this amazing country we all call home has. And uh, I hope that you'll get to spend your heritage day enjoying the incredible birds out there. So without further ado, I will see you all back next week, Tuesday, for another exciting conservation conversations. Keep your eyes on the skies and keep enjoying those birds and take care, everybody. Stay safe out there and enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night, everyone. <laughs>